Hey guys, and welcome back to lesson six in the Foundations of Algebra course. We know that algebra is the study of the operations on the real numbers. That's why we spend so long getting comfortable with the real numbers. And now that we are, we turned our attention to the operations. And the first thing we, we said in our last video is, remember those four operations? Well, it turns out someone was just fooling you. There are only two operations, addition and multiplication. And in our last video, we took care of addition. So we're set. Let's dive into multiplication. Let's do it. Just like with addition, there are a few basic ideas that we want to have under our belts before we get going. So let's lay those down. One is the multiplicative identity. You might remember that for addition, zero was the identity. Now that we're talking multiplication, one plays that role. One is the multiplicative identity, which just means when you multiply a number by one, you just get that number. One preserves its identity when you multiply. So four times one is, one, is four, excuse me, and one times four is also four. Number two, every real number except zero has a multiplicative inverse. Sometimes we call it the reciprocal. And other times we call it the flip. For example, for five, the reciprocal is one fifth. And for the number two thirds, its reciprocal is three halves. And what's really cool about a number and its reciprocal, when you multiply them together, you always get one. The third basic idea is that multiplication, just like addition, is commutative. Okay, The order in which you multiply the numbers doesn't affect the result. So for example, two times three, you get six, but you also get six if you do three times two. So we can commute the factors. All right, so let's go. Let's see how some of these numbers behave under multiplication. How about we start with the integers? Well, four times five, ah, you got that. Those are just whole numbers, right? They're integers, but those are also whole numbers. Four times five is 20, no big deal. What if we throw a negative in there? Four times negative five? Well, it turns out that's negative 20. And you might even be able to see why. Just looking at four times negative five is really negative five added four times. Negative five plus negative five plus negative five plus negative five. It makes sense that we're getting negative 20. By the way, it's the same if we did negative four times five. It, same thing, you get negative 20. If exactly one of the factors is negative, the result is negative, all right? How about two negatives? Negative four times negative five. Now that's a little harder to, to see than, than the middle one. Uh, and if we get a chance, maybe we can talk about why later. But negative four times negative five actually ends up being positive 20. Now, there's nothing special about four and five and their opposites, negative four and negative five. In fact, there's nothing special about the integers. This relationship holds for all real numbers. For any real numbers, a positive times a positive is always positive, a positive times a negative is negative, and a negative times a negative is positive. Keep those in mind as we go forward. It brings up something important. Just like addition had its main principle that guided us. It told us the only things you can ever add are the same things, and when you add the same things, you get the same things. Multiplication has a main principle as well. And check out the difference. You can multiply anything by anything. Anything you want. Multiply it by anything else you want, okay? Can you see it's on the opposite end from addition, right? It turns out I know you probably learned addition first because the teachers thought, oh, that's the easy one, and you probably thought that was the easy one, and then you moved up to multiplication. Well, it turns out, really, addition is the tough one, and multiplication is the easygoing one. It's just like, hey, whatever, multiply anything by anything, all right? Let's, let's see how that works in practice. Let's take fractions, for example. If you have 2 thirds times 5 sevenths, now, if this were addition, I want you to remember, you cannot add thirds and sevenths, right? They're not the same things. But this is multiplication, so can we add thirds and sevenths? Just yell it out. Man, 
It was so crystal clear, I could almost see the yeses that you were yelling out. Excellent job. Very nice. Yes, of course. You can multiply anything by anything. And the coolest part is you just multiply straight across. That's how multiplication works. So 2 times 5 is 10, and 3 times 7 is 21. Game over. See how nice that is? Here's another one, just to make sure. Can we multiply sevenths and fifths? Yes. Good. Of course, anything by anything. Just multiplying straight across, 22 30 fifths. 2 times 11 and 7 times 5. Could it get any better than that? Could there be a problem? I wouldn't call it a problem, but check this out. Look at this one. 17 19 times 19 20 thirds. Well, first of all, can we multiply 19 and 20 thirds together? Yes, of course. You can multiply anything by anything. But look at those numbers. That's, those are going to get big really fast. 17 times 19 and 19 times 23. I mean, do you want to multiply those together? A collective no. Okay, I'm with you. Uh, all joking aside, those, those would get really big. And if there's a way around it, I'd like to know it, wouldn't you? Ah, glad you asked. All right, well, check this out. You guys just um, went through those basic ideas with me, and we said that multiplication is commutative, right? So take a look at that 19 times 23 that we would do in the denominators, right, when we multiplied straight across. Well, that's the same as 23 times 19, isn't it? So take a look at that. I know that those fractions look different, right? That they, they are different. But the products, 17 times 19, still on the top, and 23 times 19, that's the same thing as if it were 19 times 23, right? But take a look at what happens when we commute those two bottom factors. 19 19 guys, that's just one, right? Well, if that's just one, then 17 times 17 20 thirds times one, one is the identity. It's just 17 20 thirds. Isn't that nice? What we did here is we simplified before we ended up multiplying. Okay? That's going to be really, really helpful. If you can see that, that's a great move. Here's one more, just because we did that really fast. And it, it looks so good. It's like magic. But check this out. If you had 2536 times 1925, fifths, wouldn't it be great? See those two 25s? Let's commute two of the factors. We, by the way, in the last example, we did the denominators. We commuted them. We, let's do the tops this time. Okay. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Yes, you guys are right. Of course, we can multiply 36 and 25. fifths. You got it. You don't want to do it. I get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But look, what if we commuted... 25 times 19 and made it 19 times 25. It's the same product, right? Commutativity. By the way, you can do the bottoms. You can commute the bottoms. You can commute the tops. But you can't do like a top to a bottom because that's not how we're multiplying. We multiply tops and bottoms, okay? Those are the things we can switch. But look, once we do that, see that 25, 25th? You know that's just one. So 1936 times 1 is just 1936. It's great, isn't it? All right, well, here. What if it didn't quite, you don't have exactly like a 1 that you can make, just obviously right there? Um, sometimes you can simplify even still. Um, check this out. So the 10 and the 15, those two, even though they're not the same number, so we won't get a 1 if we commute them so they're right in line. They do have a common factor, and we might be able to simplify a little bit. So let's do this. Let's, again, let's commute, and we'll do the tops again. So 7, 7 times 10 is the same as 10 times 7. Now, again, it's not as easy as those first two examples, not, not quite as smooth. But look at 10 fifteenths. They both have a factor of 5. So 10 is 5 times 2. And 15 is 5 times 3. So we can take out the 5 fifths 1. And we would be left with what? 2 thirds, right? 2 thirds. So 2 thirds times 7 elevenths. And now we still have some multiplying to do. But the numbers aren't as big as they would have been originally, right? So 2 times 4 is 14. And 3 times 11 is 33. Looking okay?
It's nice. So we're use, we're simplifying before multiplying. And we're you taking advantage of that commutative property. All right. Well, you guys know the deal with mixed numbers. We, we just don't deal with them, right? We, we don't operate with mixed numbers. So if you're asked to multiply those two, just quickly convert them into fractions. And now we're back to normal. OK, multiply straight across. We're good to go. Nothing to it. Don't operate on mixed numbers. Just convert them into fractions and go. All right. How about decimals? Well, you might ask yourself, well, do I need to line up the decimal points again like we did with addition? And you know the answer to that. Meh. No. Right. No way. Why? Because that was all about lining up the decimal places so you could add tenths with tenths, hundreds with hundreds, etc. With multiplication, that's not important. So, for example, take a look at this. See, the decimal points aren't lined up. Line them up however you want. It doesn't matter. Tell you what, I'm going to write. I haven't been writing much this lesson. I want to do a little bit of math. So let me multiply this out. So you ignore the decimal points, really, at the beginning. Just multiply like you would if they were whole numbers. So 1 times 4 is 4. 1 times 1 is 1. And 1 times 3 is 3. So let me drop my 0 here as I go to the 2. 2 times 4 is 8, 2 times 1 is 2, and 2 times 3 is 6. If I add those guys up, I think I'm getting that, all right? Now, the only thing I have to worry about, and this is the only thing that you have to concern yourself with, with multiplication and decimals, is making sure the decimal point in the answer ends up in the right spot. Well, the way you do it is you count how many decimal places um, are in the two factors. So I count three, two in the top factor and one in the bottom factor. So a total of three. So that means my answer also has to have three decimal places. So one, two, three, I'll put the decimal point right there. And if you look, that makes total sense, right? It's a number close to three times a number close to two. So the answer better be in the neighborhood of six. So the decimal point only makes sense right there, doesn't it? Three places because I got three decimal places in the, in the factors that we multiplied. All right, looking okay? All right, how about our last group, the irrationals? We've been talking about the roots. Um, so let's say someone asked you to multiply square root of 2 times square root of 5. And remember, if we were asked to add those two things, we would say, no way, can't do it. they got to be the same. But this is multiplication. So can we multiply those two? Of course. Of course we can. And you know what we end up with? Square root of 2 times square root of 5, you just multiply the two numbers underneath the roots. So we get square root of 10. That's all there is to it. Before I leave you, I just want to talk very briefly about applications of multiplication. What you'll find is that shows up when you're given some information about one, one item, uh, you know, how, how much each thing weighs, or per, per one. That's, that, those are common terms you might see in, in multiplication problems. And then at being asked for a total. Okay, Like for example, here, I'll just, it's easier to give you an example than to talk about it. Let's say gas costs $2 per gallon. How much would 10 gallons cost? All right, well, 10 times 2, um, that gives me 20. So it would cost $20. Okay, multiplication used there. Or each candy bar has five grams of fat, how many total grams of fat are there in four candy bars? All right, well, you take five times four and you get 20, 20 grams uh, total. Now, the cool thing is, because we're so comfortable with all these different types of numbers, we could answer a question um, of this type where it was like each candy bar has 5.6 grams of fat and how many total grams of fat are there in 4.25 candy bars. We can we can multiply those decimals just the same. All right. No big deal. We're in awesome shape. I'll tell you what, let's call it a day um, and I'll meet you back in lesson seven. Keep up the great work. I can tell you're working hard and it's really, really showing. I'll see you in a bit.